little summer series and uh, we, we've been asking questions that uh, need to be answered and this morning is not going to be any different. Um, and, and the Lord's just kind of confirmed two or three times this week that this is the question that needed to be answered. And that is, what about divine healing? What about divine healing? Uh, can we still expect God to heal people today? Uh, is it relevant uh, for us in this generation? Um, what is the purpose uh, for divine healing in Scripture? Now, in order for us to really get to uh, the purpose of healing, you gotta, you got to really deal with the source of sickness. Where does sickness come from? Where did it originate? Why uh, is it necessary for divine healing? Now, let me give you three sources. First of all, uh, it is in fallen humanity. Romans chapter 5 and verse number 12, the Bible says that by one man sin, sin entered into this world and sin brought about death to everybody. Uh, so we, we, you know, we see in the Garden of Eden that man lost a lot of stuff. Man lost a lot of things in the Garden when he allowed sin. But uh, one of the things that he lost was his health. And he forfeited those rights. The second source of sickness is illness comes because oftentimes from a satanic attack. A satanic attack. In Luke chapter 13, the Bible gives us a story about a woman that had been crippled for about 18 years. And Jesus encounters her. And the Bible says that he healed her of that malady. And then it rose a lot of question marks and brought about a lot of criticism. And so Jesus responded by saying, okay, it's all right then to raise an ox out of the ditch on the Sabbath day. So why wouldn't it be all right for me to heal this woman that the Bible says had been in the bounds and been chained up and really had been bound up for, by Satan for 18 years. She was a victim of Satan and illness. In Acts chapter 10, uh, Jesus, the Bible says, came healing all who were under the power of the devil. In 1 John chapter 3 and verse 18, the Bible says the reason Jesus came was to destroy the works of the devil among which was illness. So we see that fallen humanity as a source. We see that Satan is a source. And third, uh, sickness comes because they sinned. They sinned. Now let me be very quick to say, uh, not everybody that's sick and everybody that has an illness uh, are sick because of sin. Don't you leave today and communicate something that I did not say. I, I did not say that all sickness is a result of sin. That's not true. That's not biblical. That's not reality. I, I, I'm the, the, one of the probably most frustrating times of my life was when I showed up at the hospital one day and a, another pastor had preceded me in that hospital room. There was a, a man who was about to have his leg amputated and the pastor, and, he, and I came in and the guy was just weeping and crying and I assumed that he was just scared and about going to have his leg amputated and I began to minister to him to discover that the pastor who came in before me said, listen, if you just get the sin out of your life, you wouldn't have to be going to that operating room. I, I, I was frustrated as I could be about that. I'm not saying that uh, at all. But in John chapter 5, the Bible says that there was an old boy that had been lying there at the pool of Bethesda for 38 years. Jesus comes and encounters him and, and he says, what's the problem? And he said, well, the angel of the Lord comes down here once a year, but I don't have anybody to help me get down into the pool of Bethesda. Jesus healed him and then he made this statement to the man. Uh, he said, I don't want you to go sin anymore. 
lest a worse thing come upon you, giving the indication that somewhere way back in this old boy's life that he had turned his back on God, rejected God in some fashion or another, allowed sin into his life that created that paralysis within him. I uh, tell you there are a large number of people today that are suffering uh, under the malady of AIDS. They deserve our love. They deserve our compassion. And for Christians to act contrary-wise is a contradiction to the faith by which we say that we have in Christ. But many cases they are suffering because sometime they violated God's moral principle. You understand we live with the choices that we make and sometimes the choices that we make uh, will bring sickness, it will bring illness into our life. Now before we get into the meat of the message, let me give you some interesting facts about healing in the New Testament. There are 41 instances in Scripture uh, where there was a, uh, a healing there in the New Testament. All of them except one of them occurred instantaneously. Second thing is that all healings in the New Testament were, do were done thoroughly there were no relapses, and the problems did not come back on them. Now, here's, here's a major part that I, I found very interesting in this study. Is that 20% of everything that Jesus did in his ministry here in those three years uh, involved the healing of the sick. So 41 instances specifically where God instantaneously healed the sick. The motivation behind those healings was not the same, though, in every case. So why, then, did God perform the healings? What was the purpose behind these healings? Now, let me remind you, I'm not going to tell you anything that you don't already know. This is not enlightening to most of you in the room. Uh, but in every case of healing in the New Testament that took place, it was temporary. Why? Because we all bite the dust. As marvelous, as wonderful as the healing of Jesus and the apostles, all of it was temporary. Why is that? Because we're all going to die. As beautiful as some of you are, as handsome as some of you are, the fact of the matter is, you're going to wrinkle, you're going to lose your hair, you're going to get fat, you're going to get old, and every bump that you have before you die is going to relocate somewhere on your body <laughs> and reposition itself. But aren't you glad that God has said to us, one of these days, we're going to get a brand new body. Now, since the healing in the New Testament was temporary, uh, ultimately going to die, therefore, there must be another ultimate reason, another ulterior motive behind why Jesus performed these healings. If it was just temporary, they died anyway, then why then did God heal them? And that's what I've come to tell you about today. First of all, you ready? Here we go. Purpose for the healing. The authenticity or the authentication of Jesus as the Messiah. Healings were an authentication, authentication of Jesus as the Messiah. May I say to you that Jesus did not heal Anybody to draw attention to himself. He did not heal the sick to bring some attention to the movement uh, that God was uh, doing in and of his life. Uh, nor to have the memory in people's mind that he was some kind of wonder worker. But to authenticate 
his role as the Messiah and to draw attention to ultimately to the work of God. Now that doesn't mean that he didn't have compassion on the sick at all. Matthew chapter 20, the Bible says that he was moved with compassion and he healed them. Often Jesus felt sorry. Often he was moved with compassion and love toward the sick. But all healing that he performed in the New Testament was to authenticate the fact that he was indeed the sent one from God. Look in your Bible, if you will, to Acts chapter 2. And I hope you'll keep your Bible real handy this morning because you're going to need it. In Acts chapter 2, and I want you to see verse 22 with me. Acts chapter 2 and uh, verse 22. You men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you as ye yourselves also know. So here is Simon Peter at the point of preaching that great Pentecostal sermon. The Bible says that he performed those signs and those wonders and miracles to authenticate or to corroborate his Messiahship. In John chapter 14 and verse number 11, Jesus says, Believe me that I am the, in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the very works sake. Now in other words, what he's saying here in that passage, if you can't believe me because of my preaching and my teaching, then look at what God is doing in me and through me and let that be the convincing factor to you that I am who I say that I am. Authenticating his Messiahship in the 10th chapter of John and verse number 37, the Bible says, if I do not the works of my father, believe me not. But if I do the works of my father, though you believe not me, believe the works that you may know and believe that the Father is in me and I in him. John said again in chapter number 20, he did a lot of other miracles that are not recorded in this book, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ. So we're talking about divine healing. What is the purpose of divine healing? If it's just temporary, why heal him to begin with? Well, he did it to authenticate his Messiahship. Number two, it is the confirmation of the message of the apostles. The signs, the wonders, the miracles, the healing were confirmation of the message uh, of the apostles. Now, what was that message? Well, there was only one message. Jesus Christ is Lord. That's the message. You remember one of my favorite stories in the Bible um, when Philip was preaching that major revival and the Holy Ghost said to Philip, Philip, I, I want you to leave this great meeting. I know people are being saved and I know lives are being changed and I, I know there's a great move of God going on here, but I want you to leave this revival and I want you to go where I'm showing you. There, there's an Ethiopian eunuch out here in the middle of nowhere and the Bible says that he drew over to that chariot where that eunuch was reading the scripture and the Bible makes a statement Philip preached unto him Jesus he, he didn't give him the apostles creed he, he didn't give him some doctrinal statement of faith uh, he didn't give him some kind of uh, confirmation from uh, the constitution and bylaws of an organization he preached Jesus, not theology, but Jesus. That was the message of the apostles. But that message needed some confirmation. And the reason it needed confirmation is you and I, we already have the New Testament. We've got those 27 books that are at our disposal. They didn't have them in the apostles' day. And so the Lord God in heaven 
confirmed the message of the apostles with these signs and wonders and miracles. Look at Mark chapter 16 and verse 17. Mark chapter 16, verse 17. And these signs shall follow them that believe. In my name shall they cast out devils. They shall speak with new tongues. They shall take up serpents. And if they drink any deadly thing, it will not hurt them. They shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. So these signs and wonders were confirming the message of the apostles. And some of these signs and wonders uh, were accomplished in the book of Acts. As a matter of fact, everything that you just read right there and heard right there was done in the book of Acts except one, and that was to drink the poison. There's no, no record that I've been able to find where anybody drank poison. And I'm going to tell you, I could handle about every one of those things that, that's recorded there, but I ain't picking up no snakes. Excuse my terminology. No, I ain't picking up no snakes. Now, back where I came from, over in the mountains of western North Carolina, they still do some of that stuff over there. They got a box up on the platform, and they'll pull out them snakes and go to that. Not me, sister. I'm not in my right mind am I going to be doing that. Now, now listen to verse 19. So then, after the Lord had spoken unto them, he was received up into heaven and set on the right hand of God, and they went forth and preached everywhere. And they talk about the apostles went forth and preached everywhere. The Lord working with them and confirming the word with signs following. Now what does that mean? It means that everywhere the apostles went, Jesus went with them and performing signs through them. Now I'm not sure what all of that means, but healings uh, certainly took place. And the purpose was to confirm the message to the unbelievers that this was truth. This was the Word of God. A great passage of Scripture is Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 3. How shall we escape so great? Uh, how, how shall we escape if we neglect so great salvation? which at the first began to be spoken by the Lord and was confirmed unto us by them that heard him. God also bearing them witness both with signs and wonders and different miracles and gifts of the Holy Ghost according to his own will. That message was confirmed by healing. Now in the book of Acts, the only people that had the gift of healing were the apostles except for one guy by the name of Ananias. He had the gift of healing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 12, here's a sign of an apostle. Listen to this. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you in all patience, in signs and wonders and mighty deeds. The, the, these apostles were the same as Jesus. They weren't doing the miracles to draw attention to themselves, but so that the message that they were preaching would be received and confirmed as from God. They didn't have some sideshow in a tent someplace, but it was there to confirm the authenticity of the message that they were preaching. You say, preacher? I'm going to stretch you just a little bit here now. Is that still needed today? Possibly. What do you mean? Unfortunately, we still have some countries where the Word of God is not available. Now that breaks my heart. And we're, we're working on that. As a matter of fact, your church is involved right now in a translation uh, with a language and a dialect uh, to translate the New Testament uh, it, so that this country could uh, have the Word of God. We're, we're involved in Bible translation. Unfortunately, there's still many that don't have it. And, and so there may need to be some signs and wonders. Why? Because you and I here in this country, we have the Word of God. We have 27 books of the New Testament at our disposal. And the Word of God talks about a closed canon. But where the Word of God is preached and taught 
and communicate it. I want you to know God uses that word today in powerful ways. Doesn't mean that God is limited to or confined, but I can tell you this, he will never contradict what's contained in his word. Now, let me give you number three. You ready? We're talking now about the reasons or the purpose behind these miracles. And I'm about to get excited because I know where I'm going in this third point. And I love it. It's the evangelization of the lost. God performed these miracles for the evangelization of the lost. Take your Bible and look with me to John chapter number 4. I'd like everybody, if you have a copy of the Word of God, to go there with me. John chapter number 4, and I want you to pick it up in verse 46. So Jesus came again into Cana of Galilee where he made the water to wine. And there was a certain nobleman whose son was sick at Capernaum. When he heard that Jesus was come out of Judea into Galilee, he went unto him and besought him that he would come down and heal his son, for he was at the point of death. Then said Jesus unto him, Except you see signs and wonders, you will not believe. The nobleman saith unto him, Sir, come down ere my child die. Jesus saith unto him, Go thy way. Thy son liveth. And the man believed the word that Jesus had spoken unto him, and he went his way. And as he was now going down, his servants met him and told him, saying, Thy son liveth. Then inquired he of them the hour when he began to amend. And they said unto him, Yesterday at the seventh hour the fever left him. So the father knew it was at the same hour in the which Jesus said unto him, Thy son liveth. And himself believed and his whole house. You understand that the purpose of the healing of that son was not for a well son to be snatched from death. That was not the primary reason. The primary reason was that this nobleman, this influencer, this powerful man in the community and his whole house could come to the saving knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. God used that healing for a greater nobility than just raising that son up from being sick. One of my favorite uh, of all time passages to preach from, and I preach from it a lot in revival, is the story when Peter and John are about to enter into the temple. It's over in Acts chapter 3, and they get over there, and this old boy, he's been lying there at the gate, and the Bible says he's been begging. Alms, alms. Do you remember what Peter and John said to him? They said, Silver and gold have we none, but such as we have in the name of Jesus, rise and walk. And immediately, that old boy got up leaping and praising God and running into the temple, telling everybody and showing everybody what had happened. And the Bible says that everybody recognized him and they were all filled with amazement. Now I want you to listen to what happens in the fourth chapter, beginning in verse 3. And they laid hands on them and put them in hold unto the next day, for it was now eventide. How be it? <laughs> Many of them which heard the word believed, and the number of the men was about 5,000. Get the scenario. Here's a cripple. Here comes Peter and John. And God worked a miracle. He leaped and praised God. He was healed instantly there. And the Bible says this crowd was moved to awe. And Peter preached. And 5,000 men. I've got a little bit of imagination. Let's just think if there was one woman for every man, one child for every couple, there may have been 15,000 that got saved right then. What was the purpose of this healing? Was it for this cripple to walk? No. The ultimate plan of God was to see the salvation of these souls. Yeah, thank God. 
He's interested in that cripple. He's not, matter of fact, it's the same God who knows even the hair on your head. He's interested in the little things of our life as well. He's interested in that cripple. There is no doubt about it. But he wasn't going to walk long because eventually he would die. But the salvation that the others received that day was for eternity. In Acts chapter 9, just a few pages from uh, where you are, in verse number 32, Acts chapter 9, verse 32, it came to pass as Peter passed throughout all quarters, he came down also to the saints which dwelt at Lydda. And there he found a certain man named Annas, uh, which had kept his bed eight years and was sick of the palsy. And Peter said unto him, Annas, Jesus Christ maketh you whole. Arise and make your bed. And he arose immediately. Now he didn't go over to this old boy and say, hmm, now let's you and I talk about the condition that you have here. Uh, let's have a little dialogue together. And w would you just maybe wiggle one of your toes for me? O or maybe I could help you turn over in the bed. Maybe that would help a little bit. No. He went for the whole thing. He says, get up. Look at verse 35. And all, say the word all. Didn't say some of them. Didn't say part of them. Didn't say a few of them. Said all of them. And all that dwelt at Lydda and Saron saw him and turned to the Lord. Do you, do you know what I just read? Here's an old boy been laying there sick for about eight years. God gloriously healed him. Not to get him up out of the bed necessarily. He did care about that old boy. But two cities, every one of them in two cities were eternally changed by the power of God. Look, look, look with me now. There's another section just on down in verse 39. Then Peter arose and went with them. When he was come, they brought him into the upper chamber. And all the widows stood by him weeping and showing the coats and garments which Dorcas made while she was with them. But Peter put them all forth and kneeled down and prayed. And turning to the body said, Tabitha, arise. And she opened her eyes. And when she saw Peter, she sat up. And he gave her his hand and lifted her up. And when he had called the saints and widows, presented her alive. And it was known throughout all Joppa. And many believed in the Lord. Did, did, did Simon Peter go down there and raise this woman up so that she could go back and sew some more coats and sweaters? No. The purpose was for the manifestation of the power of God to be revealed in Joppa and salvation came to many of their households. The purpose of the healing was for the salvation of the lost. Number four, the glorification of the Lord. What is the purpose of divine healing? The glorification of the Lord. In Mark chapter 2, there was a paralytic with Jesus. He couldn't get, uh, couldn't get into the house on his own, so he had four buddies, put him on a cot, carried him up on the roof, cut a hole in the roof, and let him down into the presence of Jesus. And Jesus said unto him, Your sins be forgiven you. Look, look with me, if you will, Mark chapter 2. And uh, watch verse 12. Mark chapter 2. And uh, notice verse 12. And immediately he arose 
and took up the bed and went forth before them in so much that they were all amazed and what? Glorified God, saying, we never saw it uh, on this fashion. Do you know that sometimes, and here's so tragic, especially in our modern era, especially in the 21st century, you know, if God's not going to get voluntary praise from his people, uh, sometimes he'll just do a sign and a wonder and a miracle to evoke the glorification from people to himself. We've never seen anything like this. Do you remember in Luke 13 when we talked about that paralytic woman that had been there for 18 years? She, The Bible says she straightened up and she praised God. In John chapter 11, word got to Jesus. Jesus, your best friend's going to die if you don't get over there and heal him. Jesus said, this sickness is not unto death but for God's glory that he may be glorified in it. Every healing in the New Testament ultimately was to bring glory to God periodically. A couple of times this week, periodically in this fellowship, regularly in this fellowship, people will come and they will describe their physical healing that God had somehow touched their body and raised them up. Do you know what the first words out of their mouth and the first words out of the mouths of people who hear it? Praise God! The glorification of the Lord. Let me end it with this. Purpose of healing is the sanctification from sin. Now you knew when I started talking about healing, ultimately we were going to wind up over in James 5. So go on over there with me and, and let's just look for a few minutes uh, at that passage in James 5. James chapter 5, and I want you to look beginning in verse number 13. James chapter 5, verse 13. Are you there? Say amen. All right, here we go. Is any among you afflicted? Let him pray. Is any merry? Let him sing psalms. Is any sick among you? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. Now, the Bible says, is there any sick among you? That word sick, you ought to underline it, highlight it, maybe draw some attention to it. It is the strongest Greek word that can be used to translate sick. You find it when word got to Jesus about Lazarus. He's sick unto death. You find it again when um, Peter's mother-in-law, Jesus, was asked to heal Simon Peter's mother-in-law. She had a high fever. Uh, she was sick unto death. Jesus healed her. I'm wondering, that Simon Peter's mother-in-law, I'm, I'm wondering if that's why Peter denied the Lord three times because he healed his mother-in-law. I don't know. <laughs> Critically ill. If you've come to the place in your life that you, the, the, the doctors don't have the solution. If you're critically sick, nowhere else to turn, call for the elders of the church to anoint with oil. The word oil there, there's nothing special about that oil. Uh, nothing special about that word. It, it's just the word that's used when you press out the juice out of the olives and it's the oil that is used to, to cook with. What, what, what are you saying, preacher? I, I just want you to understand something. Uh, th there's nothing special about the anointers. There's nothing special about the oil that the anointers use. W watch this, watch this. 
anointing him with the oil in the name of the Lord and the prayer of faith shall save the sick and the Lord will raise him up. It's not the anointers. It's not the oil. Jesus raises him up. He's the healer. We're just the conveyors of the oil. Now watch verse 15. We're talking here about the purpose of healing. And the prayer of faith shall save the sick. And the Lord shall raise him up. And if he hath committed sin. You know, I don't know why we don't talk more about this. We just talk about the physical aspect of this phenomenon of calling for the elders of the church. We never get to this next point. The Bible says, and he, if he hath committed sins, shall be forgiven him. Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed. The sickness and the healing of that sickness brings about a resurfacing of those sins in our lives that have gone undealt with, unconfessed, unforgiven. And the Bible says there's something about that time when people call for the elders of the church and the anointing and the oil that brings them to an awareness. Hey, you know what? I've got some things in my past that I have let go that I have never acknowledged and it's a resurfacing of it so that they may seek God's forgiveness and be healed spiritually. God doesn't just want to heal us of our diseases. We're going to grow old. We're going to die. That's just temporary. He doesn't want to just repair our bodies that are going to die anyway. Ultimately, he wants to heal our spirits. Question, does God still heal today? Absolutely. The Bible says by his stripes we are healed. Here's what I know. That God wants to do healing right now, today, among some of you. The healing of the major damage that has been done by the tyranny of sin in your spirit. You understand, I love that song that we sang so wonderfully early this morning. Matter of fact, at 8 o'clock, I just about couldn't get it together to preach. I probably should have waited a little bit longer before I ever started preaching. It was just overwhelmed me. I, I have come by the way of the cross. It's the only way any of us will ever have a half a hallelujah chance of ever making it into heaven, ladies and gentlemen. It, it is when Jesus Christ's blood is applied to our sin and covers us and heals us from this brokenness that we have before God. But may I say to you, that is available to you right now. And the beautiful part about it is that healing is instantaneous. The moment that you by faith Turn to Jesus Christ and confess Jesus as your Lord and repent of your sins. That quick, that quick, God forgives you and saves your soul. How many of you right now would be honest enough with God, honest enough with me, honest enough with this crowd? You could lift your hand right now all over the building and say, Preacher, I know that I'm saved. I know I'm on my way to heaven. God has healed me of sin sickness and covered me with his blood. And if I were to die right now, I know that I'd go to heaven because of his healing. Would you hold your hand up good and high? Just hold it up good and high. While you got it up there, why don't you just give God a little bit of glory? Give him a little bit of praise. <laughs> Worship him just a little bit right now because he saved you. 
for those of you who could not raise your hand, for those of you who may have raised your hand just to keep people from being aware, you really didn't know, you really, but can I just say to you, God wants to do a miracle in you today. God wants to do a miracle in you. In a minute, Matthew's going to come. He's going to lead us in this hymn of invitation. And we're going to stand to our feet. If you're here this morning and you say, Pastor, I'm sin sick. My sins have separated me from God. I'm on my way to hell. And I realize that God's the only one that can save me and heal me of this sin sickness. I want you to slip out to the nearest aisle, wherever you may be in this building, and make your way right here to the front. Let me pray with you before you go home. I give you my word on the authority of the word of God that if you will admit who you are before God, confess your sin, believe in your heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, the Bible says thou shalt be saved.